Welcome to this part two of the webinar conducted by FIX today and with international researchers from three different countries. The US, UK, or you are based in the UK at the moment, but you usually work at the University in Australia, Julian Sefton Green and Jonas Lindroth uh, from Sweden. I just want to introduce you very shortly, and I would like to start with you because you had to get, you had to be very up uh, early up this morning from your bed, dawn halfway. Can you just say a few words about yourself and uh, your uh, contact and relationship with teachers in mm -hmm. the U.S.? Yes, I'm a, an associate professor at George Mason University, which is the largest university in uh, Virginia. Um, it's outside Washington, D.C., and I am connected with uh, our lead project uh, person on this TRIO project, uh, Greta Goodman's daughter. We met through a open gate um, grant, which is an exchange between Oslo Met University and George Mason University, and uh, we are on a research, uh, we have a research agenda. Now that is uh, actually been spiked by COVID, so. Yes, thank you. And we will hear, hear more about um, the situation in the US and also the survey you have conducted. I think I will continue with you, Jonas Lindroth. You are usually at the University of, of Gothenburg, but the last weeks you have done some quite uh, interesting things. Uh, it is related to uh, the website Skola Hemma. Can you say a little bit more about what you have done? Yes, uh, I will talk later a little bit more about Skola Hemma, but it is a crisis project where uh, we try to provide resources for teachers and uh, principals in order for them to handle the consequences of the corona pandemic. And I have been working as a form of uh, resource when it comes to reading, interpreting and spreading results from research, educational research, that is. Yeah. Thank you. And we will hear more about what happened in Sweden and what kind of resources you have put up on the website. And lastly, Julian Sefton Green, you are with us from London, but you're usually in uh, Australia where you work at Deakin University. Just want to see, uh, say hello to you as well. Are you with us? Hi there. Hi. Uh, very pleased to be able to join you. I can't start my video because my co-host has stopped that. Okay. So I expect you'll have to give me some authority. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to join you. And um, I've worked with uh, colleagues at the University of Oslo for 10, 15 years, particularly in a project in Gurudalan, looking at um, uh, young people's learning uh, throughout the life course in what we called learning lives. And um, this built on and is related to other work that I've done looking at young people's learning out of school in informal and non-formal learning centers. Thank you, Julian, and I managed to make you a co-host so we can see you as well. Okay, then I will think I will start with the US and I will start with you, Don. So I see you later, guys, Jonas and uh, Julian. And I mean, we read so much in the news, Don, about the situation in the US. Uh, it's been terrible in cities like New York City. Uh, of course, all the schools are also closed down in the US. And you have worked with teachers for a long, long time. And, and of course, you have had many, many chats with them during the last weeks. How will you say the situation is for, for teachers in the US at the moment? At the moment, I think it's getting better for them. Um, there have been some plans put in place. Um, it's taken a while. <laughs> um, not all of them have worked. Um, one of the things that I hear from teachers, I work in a program which fosters and facilitates teachers' abilities to use digital technologies and digital learning and uh, for in-service teachers. And one of their frustrations were they know what to do, but because school divisions are, are mandating all of the processes here and the state, um, they're not 
getting their voices heard. So they're a little bit frustrated. And this is how this project kind of started. It became very personal for me because they were saying, you know, despite the fact that we know what to do, we think we know what to do, we have the tools, um, we're not getting the support that we need to just go ahead and do our job. And the main thing is they just want to persist in educating their students. So it's taken a while to get that going because schools just started direct instruction really uh, April 13th. And that was with review of content. And now it's getting more toward maybe a little bit of new content, but we're almost at the end of the school year. So now it's back to review. <laughs> You're, uh, you're muted, Oisin. It happens always. I know. <laughs> Together with your colleague, uh, Greta Goodman's daughter, in, in a way, you have conducted the survey. And the interesting thing with that survey is that you are actually are able to compare Norwegian teachers and the US teachers mm -hmm. on the same kind of questions. Can you say a little bit about the Teachers Readiness Online project and also this specific survey that they are actually publishing this week? Yes, um, we were, uh, it was Greta who really got this going um, uh, after conversations about vulnerable learners. And I told her, well, I've been hearing these things that I don't know if teachers are ready. So we quickly put this little quick little eight question survey together, asking them what is your previous experiences with um, online learning? And then to elaborate on that readiness. And then we had sections about how are you meeting uh, on the needs of all learners, vulnerable learners, those who are challenged uh, by either individual challenges or, or their environment. Um, and we, it just started to snowball through our networks and we were able to uh, reach 36 different countries or so. It's translated into eight different um, uh, languages. And all we found this, one of our journals, our premier journals in educational technology started, uh, decided they were gonna do this open access, really fast track, uh, special issue. And so the two days after our survey closed, we were able to submit our findings based on Norway and the US, which in, interestingly aren't that, uh, there's some minor differences, but they're very much similar into what the teacher said. That's interesting. And for those who are interested in that article and other articles, we will of course link to uh, that special issue, and I think it's open access, so everyone also outside uh, the EPR address at universities can actually look into those it, articles. Yes, it should be out this week, and it's uh, you know interesting. On the findings that we found were, you know, teachers um, don't have a lot of experience teaching online. They have a lot of experience with the tools, but not actual teaching. And for us as teacher educators, that's very informative for us. Um, and some of the other differences that we, uh, some of the similarities that we found is that none of the teachers complained in the survey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that somebody else's fault. I'm going to make it work. And actually, the title of the article, um, We Always Make It Work, came from one of the voices of the teachers. Mm -hmm. So it was very hopeful. Good. And thank you. Um, I think I would like just to add one more question. I can see some more information about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have been working with teacher education for a few years. Mm -hmm. How do you think actually the experience among teachers and also in the school systems will affect the ways in which we teach pre-service teachers? You would hope <laughs> that this is going to have some impact on pre-service and in-service education. I feel that in-service education probably can move a little bit faster mm -hmm. because when you do in-service, it's advanced graduate study and it's not necessarily, you know, they know all the basics. They have all of the classroom management down, they have their content areas down and we're able to move a little bit faster on trying to get them to have experiences. I know for me, 
I'm going to put in some kind of field experiences with teaching online in my program. We kind of, we've been talking about it for years, decades, we've been talking about that. <laughs> Pre-service education, it might be more of a modeling. We maybe, we have to work with teacher educators, digital competences to get them to, you know, just do a lesson here and there and model blended learning and online learning. Um, that might, I, to have radical changes in pre-service education, I think is asking a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but if, if the schools demand it, if it comes up from the schools, then perhaps it'll move faster. Our article has some uh, ways and, and implications for teacher education. So hopefully, and I really encourage people to go to visit that journal because that journal has some best practices and practical things for teachers and teacher educators. So I can't wait till it comes out. Thank you very much, John, and, and also for joining us just after your breakfast you. in the US. You are <laughs> six you. hours behind, I think. <laughs> Uh, you. Jonas, you're just ahead of us because you're in Gothenburg and it's the same time zone. And I think the last things that Don actually sort of uh, focused on give a good transition to the work you have been doing. Because what you have tried, if I understand it right, you have tried to transform what we know from previous research about digital learning and digital environment and see if we can learn something from those findings that can inform the situation we have today. So please tell us a little bit about Skola Hemma. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, as I said, Skola Hemma is a collaborative project made up by uh, different organizations that either have formal responsibilities in relation to the Swedish school system or are stakeholders with the will and capability to provide some form of support to schools during the pandemic. It is led by something called RISE, which stands for Research Institute of Sweden, and it is funded by the Swedish National Agency for Education. Uh, the overall goal of the project is to be a support for schools to handle the consequences of the pandemic. It started in March, and as it stands now, we will go on until mid-June. And the main thing we have been doing is to be a portal for information, but also develop our own support materials. Everything from uh, checklists to articles with teachers about how they teach during the pandemic, uh, interviews, and also commentaries on research and uh, interviews with researchers. And it is that part that I have been responsible for conducting. Uh, which means that I've been forced to look at existing research and extrapolate it in such a way so it makes sense and is useful in relation to the corona pandemic. So that is basically what, what this work has, has sort of been about. Would you say that there are any challenges in that process of transforming sort of scientific findings and make it sort of to make meaning with them in a very chaotic practice where we try to have some kind of school in very different ways? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, like, but, but at the same time, it is important to not just say that, oh, there aren't any research about this specific situation, so we don't know anything. So, for, for, for example, if you, so some of the challenges has been generalized about general bacil how general the research is basically uh, and uh, for instance you have been had to ask yourself is findings in higher education relevant in a k-12 perspective in if so uh, for what grades and so on but I don't know do you want me maybe I should give some examples of some of the research or some of the advice that we have have uh, promoted in in school I'm for instance there are research stressing the importance now of, of having pacing guides in distance education, especially for uh, at need students. And that leads sort of to a recommendation from our side to point out that it is extra clear, extra important now that teachers are very clear in their communication about how long time a certain assignment should take. So very mundane, very down to art, but also a hands-on advice based on previous research. <laughs> Uh, another such example is that research shows that screen time during long periods can be exhausting. So we recommend, for instance, when you have pre-recorded 
um, pre-recorded direct instruction, use shorter videos, make the content in smaller chunks instead of having long videos. And there are also some, some things that, that I would say the whole school system needs to address that you can look at. For instance, if you look at research on dropout rates and reasons behind dropouts in higher education, in online and distance education, then we know that one of the main reasons is the, um, the student's background, their individ the individual factors relating to their background. Taking that together with studies that look at the quality of experience that uh, students have of distance education, that also points that uh, the main variable why you experience uh, the distance education as motivating has to do with uh, your background variables, if you are motivated when you enter. And that leads me to conclusions such as if, if we don't foresee that we might be in a situation where uh, the ongoing change to online learning could potentially be a disaster for equality. Uh, and maybe we need to address that more. So there are all these kinds of findings in the research, but you need to interpret them and you need to discuss them in order for them to be directly useful. In the end, I asked Dawn about how the experience we have now and also the findings in different surveys uh, might have an effect on teacher education. But I mean, when you have worked with this research and also kept an eye on how actually teachers are working in Swedish schools, do you have any idea about how these new experiences will affect school in Sweden? In the long, in the long term? What's the question for me? Or yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, do you think that teachers will uh, have a different practice in the physical classroom when they get back to school? I mean, I, I know that not so many students in Sweden have been out of school physically. Well, we have been, I know in my area, we have a school, I mean, in, we have a program that is specifically for teaching teachers to facilitate and design online and blended learning. And that uh, reflected the school's push in our area to do blended learning. Mm -hmm. Online learning, not so much, but the blended learning. Mm -hmm. But it just tells me that we haven't done enough where the blended learning is happening in the classroom. So it's being defined by sitting there and doing online stuff in the classroom on a computer where you have somebody doing the self-regulation. Um, we haven't really prepared students for this, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can foresee, you know, now students all got devices. That was one of the big things they spent the two weeks in March doing, giving students devices, uh, putting in hotspots because half of the population in the United States do not have uh, high speed internet. So they had to, you know, we're still talking about infrastructure issues too, which we thought we had, we had um, managed. Yeah. So I feel that that push for that blended learning and that online learning, I think in the schools, they'll, they will, it'll accelerate some of those because now they've given all the kids the mm -hmm. devices now, so. Mm -hmm. That is different in Sweden, isn't it, Jonas? That you have more experience with, let's say, one-to-one -one classrooms. Yeah, one thing that we have I seen. The internet. <laughs> yeah, one thing that we have seen. Uh, one should stress out that in Sweden, it's only grade ten to twelve that are closed mm -hmm. in the K-12 system. Uh, but one thing that we have seen is that infrastructure hasn't been a major problem at all. Uh, mm -hmm. That was in place before mm -hmm. this happened. So the, on, on the other hand, we have an extremely decentralized school system and that has posed a lot of challenges mm -hmm. for us. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons why we need to, needed to make uh, School I Hemma such a largely collaborative project. Mm -hmm. I just want to break in here and, and uh, very soon I will approach Julian Sefton Green, uh, but I want to launch a poll. Um, approximately 100 uh, people have been following this webinar the last uh, 48 hours, sorry, 48 minutes. <laughs> it was a very long webinar. 
so I launched the poll now and you're asked uh, to, um, it's a bit hard because it's in Norwegian, but you're asked to sort of tick off what kind of themes or topics you are most interested in when it comes to research. And just, I'll, I will let that sort of run. And then I will start with you, Julian, because you have slightly different perspective. I mean, you haven't done so much research just now, the last weeks. You have not sort of put up a school hemma for uh, Australia, but you have been in a way in the field of how we learn in different contexts for more than two decades. And I just want to, to have a few ideas from you of how this is actually maybe transforming the whole school system with hundred thousand of teachers and billions of students having very new experience of how to learn and do it in new ways in a new context. That was a very open question, so I know, but I know you can, that is okay. a point of departure for you. Thank you very much, Austin. And thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start with the obvious observation um, that school is clearly about more than just learning. And in many countries around the world, the problem is faced in a, the problem of the, the 1.3 billion children who are out of school. The governments and policy around the world often describe this as children being denied learning. And I think that's problematic. Um, it's true, but it's also problematic in a number of ways. If I was going to take a cynical or negative point of view, I would say that the crisis has shown us um, two very important reasons for schooling that are often disguised in our everyday. And I, there are reasons which are not always shared by teachers. And these reasons are that school performs a stratification and an assessment function. In England, where I've landed up during the crisis, the anxiety is about the end of year, end of school results and the university entrance exams. And people are terribly worried, with good reason, but terribly worried about what the significance will be for cohorts and generations of young people who will not have access to being measured. And this shows still fundamentally school and uh, education systems are oriented towards assessment. And the second key function of schooling that has been really thrown into relief by the crisis is that of its function as childcare. We know that mass industrialized schooling was invented in the um, late 19th century, significantly as a way of keeping children out of the labor market and allowing the rest of the, the population to engage in the labor market. And again, um, this has become very apparent at the moment that the real problems with school being closed in a country like the UK um, uh, is about uh, what this means for families and um, economic implications of keeping people out of the, the workplace. Now, I, don't, I think those two reasons are very important, obviously, and I think they are reasons that often engage teachers, but teachers, I think, and schools often see their function in other terms than simply that of assessing children and allowing people to go to work. Because I think many teachers um, and many schools see, they, see the institution of schooling as performing a wider social function in terms of developing the young person's understanding of their place in society, in terms of developing uh, citizens, and for creating all sorts of learning opportunities, um, which are more than simply um, the acquisition of discrete skills that can be tested. And I think the crisis in that sense um, has been very interesting in engendering a debate about what the purpose of school should be and where learning should take place and how it takes place. Because it's quite obvious that requiring families to do school at home is not quite the same thing as thinking about ways to engage young people in meaningful or purposeful learning. Um, and that what you learn at school isn't always educational. I think teachers would say the same, all teachers would say the same of this, but also what and how you learn in the family is by no means an adequate substitute for what happens in schools. And this is a real problem. So in that sense, the crisis is in some ways quite a positive intervention in what is um, a, a real problem facing our societies in terms of what schooling should be for. Of course, there's no good way to introduce existential crisis and certainly this kind of problem is not a very nice or helpful way to do things so i'm not terribly optimistic that people around the world and politicians can take advantage of the crisis to rethink school but i do think um, it has helped as jonas um, and dawn have said uh, show us the ways that school for all the ways that many societies pretend that schooling is a fair and equitable way 
to support all children, it's actually shown up terribly how unfair schooling is. So in Australia, where I'm based, absolutely the crisis has shown up the percentage of children who don't have access to the internet, who don't have devices at home, um, which isn't always the problems, uh, to be fair, that you experience in Scandinavia. But in Australia, that, the social injustice of that has absolutely been thrown in people's faces. And it's real, people have realized, the politicians have realized, it's unacceptable to say that you're offering all children the right to an education if you can't offer them all these resources. I think there are other traditions of research in education which have concentrated on some of these questions for a long time. I would point to the American-based uh, Connected Learning Research Network, which is run by Mimi Ito out of the University of Irvine, and the attempts there to systematically investigate how young people's interest-driven learning experiences can contribute to other kinds of learning and other ways engaging in purposive educational activities. And I think the crisis should in some ways help us revisit some of those kinds of projects in order to see other ways uh, of looking at learning. The project that I was involved in with you, Oystein, the Learning Lives Project, also paid great attention to the range and diversity of young people's learning experiences and the depth and quality of the kinds of learning that they're engaged with. And this is the kind of research that I, I would like to see paid attention to um, as we come out of the crisis, rather than uh, uh, an attempt simply to kind of go back to what we had before with a lot more online stuff. Um, and that in itself is going to be terribly challenging because much of the online learning materials are owned and led by the huge global multinationals based in Silicon Valley. And they have a vested interest in a form and a definition and a marketization of online learning, which I do not believe is in every child's interest and certainly not in children's interests in many countries around the world. Thank you. Uh, and I think uh, you're talking about the crisis in a way that is a kind of intervention. And that is really, really interesting. It's not an intervention we have sort of asked for or, or wished. <laughs> no, it's not been thrust into an experiment. Yeah. But, but I, I think it's important that we can think of how we actually organize learning and uh, how we also can combine different kinds of uh, context for learning when we are sort of starting up again. And I want to pay attention to one of the questions and I thank you Bjorn for following the Q and A um, uh, here. And um, one of the questions is, can we consider, and I will like to post that questions to both Dawn, Jonas and Julian, it would be nice to see you again. We are closing in just uh, three minutes. Um, can we consider a combination of homeschooling and ordinary schooling, and other research that actually focus on this. I mean, can we can we sort of think of a situation where we not send our kids to school for five days and then two days off, and have a sort of a more fluid way of organizing teaching? Anyone? Well, I guess Almost. that would depend on the level of of schooling, I guess that's what we have in higher education and you might for some groups, it might be considerable, but for other groups, it might be very unsuitable, I think, uh, especially at needs children and those who come from backgrounds without a strong study environment at home. That means I that, I'll... I mean, routines are very, very important. Sorry, Dawn, for interrupting, no, please. No, no, I, I think it goes to uh, something Julian said, and it's something that I've been trying to instill in my program. I work with teachers as designers, not as lesson planners, so they need to design meaningful experiences. And the idea of blended learning, you know, it's all about, it's not about organizing the time and where it is. It's about how to make the most of the different environments and the aspects of the tools that actually foster learning. Um, you know, so when they do blended learning, uh, there's these models. Well, I, I don't use those models. I make up my own because affordance analysis tells me that if this is the best way for reflection might be to have an asynchronous conversation, then what, wherever that happens, you know, it might be online is a better fit for that than having the kids sit in class and nod their heads when you know you say, oh yeah, I'd like to see my kids, 
Well, I like to see my students learning and I can do that a lot in online. So very quickly, yeah. thank you very much. Very quickly, um, I do think teacher training needs to think about ways in which can support teachers to consider themselves as educators outside of school um, as much as in school. And I would hope that teacher training colleges and institutions are already designing courses to do that at the moment. And secondly, picking up on the design theme, it's also a question of spaces. Um, I once had a conversation with a principal in the UK about 15 years ago who wanted to build a new school that deliberately wasn't big enough to have everybody at school because he felt that was the only way that he could encourage teachers to design curriculum activities and a range of different learning experiences to make that happen. And I, I say that completely supporting the kind of uh, caveats that Jonas outlined as well and the terrible challenges that the, the crisis has thrown us, shown us about children who live in poverty as well. Nevertheless, unless we take um, some sort of step to changing things, they'll only remain the same. And the crisis has made us ask, is that satisfactory? Thank you, Julian. And thank you also, Dawn and Jonas, for joining this part two of the webinar uh, arranged by FIX here in the University of Oslo. Uh, I would like to just share the results from the poll. In the end, uh, it says in Norwegian that uh, the learning outcome during the digital homeschooling that is a very interesting topic for many, many that has answered this poll. And uh, I know that the uh, SSB in Norway will try to, to sort of focus on that in their study. That will be in the fall and maybe later it will be published. It's also how teachers are organizing the teaching and the ways in which they use different digital tools and uh, resources. That is also a topic that very many people are interested in. Thank you again for joining us. It was uh, organized this time in two different parts. And uh, I will also again like to thank uh, Siv and Marianne for participating and Bjorn for sort of answering all the questions that are coming during this um, part two of the webinar today. And also in um, part one, we focused on the national surveys that has have been conducted the last weeks. Please follow us on FIX. Uh, we are on Facebook and on Twitter. You can uh, also join a webinar Monday, the 8th of June, same time, 2.30. And in the last webinar, 8th of June, we will actually focus on the students. <laughs>